My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Today is August 23rd, 2021. We are here today with Avi Divdivani of Ocean, New Jersey, for an interview to augment the exhibit Monmouth County 9-11 and its aftermath. This interview is being recorded with the permission of all participants. Avi, can you just confirm for me that you do indeed consent to the recording and that you understand this interview will live in the public domain? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about your early life. Where and when were you born and raised? I was born uh, 73 years ago in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, it just became Israel right around the time I was born. Um, so, uh, and I spent um, the first um, 10 years of my life over there, we immigrated to the United States in 1958. So those, during those 10 years, uh, I think was ingrained in me, some of the uh, emotions that I had immediately after the attack. So mm -hmm. I do remember very vividly, even though I was young, the, the 1956 uh, Sinai uh, war, uh, well, I remember very clearly, you know, almost nightly going down to the uh, bomb shelter, going down the stairs of the apartment building uh, we lived at, down to the bomb shelter, uh, doing air raids. I remember vividly third grade, I believe it was third grade, maybe it was second grade, recess. What we did at, at our school was doing recess, fill up sandbags and helping to pile them up against the lower windows of, of the building. Uh, the, the windows uh, were almost at ground level, some of the windows, so we had to uh, cover those up with sandbags. So, you know, th these are some of the images in my own head uh, of, uh, you know, of uh, living uh, while under attack, you know, so. Wow, that's certainly a unique experience compared to some of our other narrators. So tell us a little bit about how you come to the United States. So, so my, my, my father, so that was the last war he served in. He served in several wars prior to that. And he just uh, was looking for a better life for his children, family. So he had uh, some, uh, he had a sister living here. And basically we, we, we arranged for, uh, he arranged for a, a, a visa, uh, whatever the class was of uh, family, a family reunification visa, uh, because they had all separated after uh, uh, they were all from Poland and Warsaw, and then when the Nazis invaded Warsaw, the family kind of bifurcated. So this was the kind of reunification of my father's family. Oh, wow. So how did you feel about your new life in the United States when you arrived? Uh, it, it was exciting. I mean, you know, I was, I was still young, so I was able to uh, adapt fairly quickly. I went right into, I finished third grade over there. I went right into fourth grade in uh, New York City school system. And, um, you know, uh, did pretty well. We attended several schools, uh, junior high school. So I attended uh, elementary school in Manhattan, junior high school in the Bronx, high school at, in Brooklyn. I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, which was one of the specialized uh, schools in the city. Um, and um, after that, I went into City University where I attended as a, an undergraduate and a graduate student and as a a professional employee there. Uh, I, I, I got into, um, at that time it was called data processing, but it's technology as we know today. So I got into that and I, I learned, I was mentored and I learned uh, programming and so forth. Um, and I spent the first part of my career, my professional career as a, an employee of the um, city of New York, uh, City University in New York, um, uh, you know, holding various technical management positions in the in the IT department, which was called something else, I guess, back in those days. Uh, um, and then uh, I joined uh, the Koch administration, I guess, in the middle of his first term. It would have been around 1980, and I was uh, I was uh, then uh, part of uh, New York City government actual New York City government for the rest of my career um, till I retired. That was 10 years ago. That's fascinating. I think it's so 
important for our listeners to know a little bit about our narrators prior to their September 11th experience. So let's bring it up then to September of 2001. That month, you were the acting New York City Commissioner of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Is that correct? You had kind of just assumed that role, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's a, kind of an interesting background to that. So when I got into the Koch administration, I was in the mayor's office actually uh, doing um, non-operational, not so much operational stuff. I did some operational stuff, but it was mostly planning and, and, and um, kind of uh, what, what we call today technology governance. They didn't call it then technology governance, they called something else, maybe computer plans and control something like that, but it, it's what we know today is technology governance. Uh, and and uh, uh, part of the work that I did was uh, to look at opportunities to consolidate. The city had lots of mainframe computers. Every agency practically had a mainframe. So consolidate mainframe computers, consolidate telecommunication resources. In those days, people tended to have people in, in a high level of authority and, and multiple kind of, particularly in the financial area, had three or four computers on their desk because each computer was hardwired to a different, each uh, desktop uh, the, was hard, uh, desktop terminal was hardwired to a specific mainframe computer. So we needed to kind of rationalize all that. So out of that was born and I was part of the team that helped create this new technology agency, which I became a deputy commissioner of, that was in 1990. So during the Koch administration, we kind of created the whole idea and the concept out of that grew the creation of the agency, which occurred during the Dinkins administration. And then in, um, I guess it, uh, in the first six months of the Dick Dinkins administration, I was appointed as deputy commissioner of this new agency. And I had been its deputy commissioner um, all the way through to uh, um, this 9-11 date, but there were a couple of occasions where I was previously an acting commissioner. We had one commissioner who, who left and I was appointed acting. Then we got a new commissioner, you know, so I had been kind of running this agency operationally uh, throughout those 10 years prior to 9-11. Okay, so where was your main headquarters or your main office located? So, so the, the executive uh, headquarters of the agency was right near City Hall. Most of the mayors always liked to have their agency heads close by City Hall. So. Uh, we had uh, uh, um, headquarters that we shared with uh, the mayor's office of management and budget. This is, uh, the building was 75 Park Place. So geographically, it's kind of right behind uh, five World Trade Center, um, where uh, office of management, where office of emergency management was, was one of the buildings that collapsed. So we, we were like kind of next to, to there, but it was my, you know, a preference. Uh, to to spend m more much of my time, even after I was named uh, acting commissioner, but certainly before I was acting commissioner, spent a lot of my time in Brooklyn when we had our main data center. We shared the data um, data center with uh, 911, the police 911 dispatching system. So we actually built that whole building um, um, during um, the Dinkins administration uh, built a, a building to house this co-location of two critical agencies, this uh, agency that was created to kind of consolidate all the compute, computing plus what we understood and knew to be our most important um, you know, operational function, which is the 911 uh, dispatching system, right? So it was kind of a fortress to begin with, even before 9-11. Um, let me ask you, do you remember, I'm sure you do, the exact address in Brooklyn, just for the record? Yeah, 11 Metro Tech Center. Now, was it in Brooklyn for security purposes because that was seen as safer yeah. than being in the city or was it just a matter of real estate? Um, it was, we geographically wanted to locate it away from the civic center. Okay. Um, so, uh, which was a mistake that was made with uh, the Office of Emergency Management. And that was actually, you know, to be honest, was a mayor's mistake. He insisted on having it close by him, but, uh, he didn't care that much about us. So uh, we, were, we were able to go to Brooklyn, but apparently uh, OEM was more important than that to be in the civic center. Oh, that's fascinating. So tell me a little bit about your life as it stood before September 11th. You know, how was your professional life going? Did you feel like you were well-resourced and well-staffed to accomplish your objectives, for example? 
Yeah. Well, uh, you know, throughout my career working, I worked for four mayors. I worked for Koch, Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, and Bloomberg. Un under all of their administrations, uh, I was fortunate to, to have support and uh, uh, resourcing, but particularly so under uh, Mayor Giuliani, it, 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 was, it was critical. It was critical that um, um, uh, we had that because that's the time we started to plan during during um, the early part of the Giuliani administration. He ca he came into office in uh, January 1994, started to plan for Y2K, and I had been talking about Y2K for years before, um, and it was very hard to kind of get attention to that. Um, you know, we were doing all these other things, uh, as I said, about consolidating the mainframe computers and consolidating the network, that it was very hard to get kind of separate funding to kind of look at planning for what could happen in a Y2K scenario, particularly in the IT environment. But when uh, Giuliani came in and I started talking about this at meetings, at, at, at cabinet meetings and so forth, he was very much intrigued by this. And he actually uh, committed to planning and he ordered agency commissioners and he put Office of Emergency Management at the lead, but we, we had the co-lead uh, along with uh, the Mayor's Office of Operations, which was the, uh, they called the Mayor's Office of Operations, but they operated nothing. They basically just kind of did planning and oversight. But um, uh, so the, the partnership was the Mayor's Office of Operations, my agency and Office of Emergency Management to start this uh, Y2K planning process. Which we which we did, and it was a, a, a large, large uh, uh, process of kind of prioritizing all sorts of critical city functions in the areas of public safety, revenue uh, uh, production, uh, 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 functions that face the public directly, uh, agency mission critical stuff, and AG, agency operational stuff, and we 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 tried to identify. And it came down to about 900 or so critical critical functions in various areas. Um, obviously, the top of the list was things like the public safety stuff, but it, it came down to other things like fuel delivery for the buildings that the city owned, and and fuel delivery for the buildings that the city had interest in. Um, these are you know some of the um, you know housing authority buildings and other uh, housing. I, I don't want to call it public housing, but housing that had a quasi-public uh, uh, relationship. So, and, and um, emergency response for buildings and emergency response for um, social welfare, uh, emergency check processing for social, a lot of those kind of functions, we had to figure out contingency plans for. And obviously we did this in, in cooperation with these agency personnel who knew their business process. But at the end of what came out of all this, and it was tabletop exercises, and some of them were way over the top, some of the planning, some of the, you know, I remember one time somebody came up with the idea of actually getting, I don't know, something like 50,000 body bags for, for the sheep meadow at Central Park. I mean, it was insane kind of stuff that people were proposing. But, but we did uh, essentially create a compendium of these contingency plans, which obviously became the, the book that we followed uh, when 9-11 uh, happened. That's so interesting. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, as we come up to the day of September 11th, was that going to be a regular work day for you? And how did the day start to the best of your recollection? Kind of from your commute forward, were you living in ocean at the time? No, so he, the, the background of that was that uh, but, but my, my wife and I and my family, we had roots in, uh, in uh, Mammoth County for, for 40 years. Uh, we, we were actually living in Marlboro and raised, my son was born there and we were, we were raising, but when I was appointed deputy commissioner uh, uh, in 1990, we had to move back into the city because people at the level, during the Koch administration, I was at a, a civil service level where there was an exemption permitted. And so uh, the mayor gave me an exemption and we, we lived in Marble and so forth. But uh, after uh, I was appointed in the Dinkins administration, the, the rule was at the time that if you're at this level, you have to live 
in the city and they actually gave us 90 days. We ha I had to sell my house and, and move into the city within 90 days, which we did. So we moved to Staten Island and we did, we did, we wanted to stay close to him. My wife was uh, also in the uh, technology business. She was, uh, she had a 25 year career as a head of system engineering for international flavors and fragrances, if you're familiar with them uh, in Union, uh, New Jersey. So, uh, so, so we wanted to be close so she could get to work and so forth. Staten Island was the place we, 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 we wound up. 90 days, no small feet moving a family in 90 days. But <laughs> so that Tuesday you wake up and it's going to be a regular work day for you? Yeah, my, my work day typically started very, very early. Um, um, you know, I would be in the office by six o'clock normally. Wow. And, and it, it, even though I was uh, just appointed acting commissioner again for the second time during uh, my, my career at that agency, I, w I had it down to Brooklyn and people in, in, in New York who, who would arrive at their desk at, at nine o'clock or whatever knew you know, where to get me if I needed to be in the city for any reason. But I was I was in my office in Brooklyn. It was a corner office on the uh, on the uh, fourth floor of this building at 11 Metro Tech. There was a corner that had kind of a view of the uh, uh, Brooklyn Bridge, so I could kind of see not not all the way across, but I could see kind of on the horizon, you know, the uh, the city on the horizon. I couldn't see specifics, but you know, the horizon was the city of New York, you know, Manhattan. Yeah. Do you recall the moment you first heard something was happening? Yeah. Tell us about it. How you first heard what you thought happened at first? Yeah, I, I saw the smoke, you know, the, at around uh, 8.45 or whatever uh, that morning. I saw the smoke and that's when I, I kind of turned on um, the emergency uh, radios and, and the uh, television and everything I could to kind of to see what was going on with the smoke. It was uh, a massive amount of smoke. So. And then it was quick, pretty, so within 15 minutes, you know, I was able to see the second plane on TV. And then I knew, I knew it was an attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, first play, the first, the, the first um, incident, I, I, you know, it could have been an accident. I, I, I didn't know, but the second, the second I saw the second plane, then I knew that, uh, then it was an attack. So um, I knew we had to get into action right away. And people just started to come into work. I had an early crew because you know we had to ma manage the network and make sure everything was up and running for people coming in. But but you know people were just starting to come to work when that was going on. I read that when you heard about the attacks, you immediately did two things. As you noted, you put on the emergency management radio channel so you could follow what was going on. And you ordered that your website be disabled because you thought there was stuff on there that might be of aid to those with ill intentions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, so actually, so the website is an interesting story. Uh, uh, NYC.gov uh, is the domain. So we actually built that uh, starting in 1996. It evolved, you know, uh, but by, by, by 2000, actually that, that June, we had won a national award I think I can show you, show it to you. If I, you see that? Yes, yes. First place winner, New York City. Yeah. So that that was actually our, our third award. Um, we won third place in 1996, and um, it was a very early municipal web website. I mean, there was the White House at Gov and all that stuff, but this was really the first kind of functional, one of the early functional. Uh, Municipal websites and and they uh, the the people who ran this uh, survey of uh, governmental websites were very interested in us and kept following us. So we um, the mayor was fascinated by all this, you know. So he uh, he kind of insisted that agencies put all kind of stuff on there. And you know, against my better judgment, you know, I was in charge of this thing, but against my better judgment or, or any. Uh, uh, you know, kind of advice that I had, you know, things went on there that shouldn't have been on there, you know, so I, I was very cognizant of that. But to be honest, you know, it, it was, uh, it was really moot because by, by the time the, the, the first tower fell, which was, you know, before 10 o'clock, we lost it anyway, you know, when the tower fell, we lost the, the Verizon building, 
our connection with the Verizon building, which was right behind the uh, South Tower. And when that, when that fell, then um, you know, the Verizon building was impacted and that's what everything was lost anyway, all communication. So it would have taken us a couple of hours. We had a contingency plan, obviously, it would have taken us a couple of hours to kind of reconnect it at another location. We, but that, that whole area down there was, was pretty much a mess, right? So uh, I said, well, let's take our time and, and not put up the site as it is. Let's put up a site that'll serve this disaster, this crisis. And so one of the early things we had on the site when it finally went back up, which was much later that night, I think it was before midnight on 9-11, it was still 9-11, but just before midnight, we went back up, which uh, a request for material. I mean, there were certain things, we had already a list of things that the city needed to conduct the emergency functions. Uh, um, so we, we, we put it out there and companies, you know, corporations that were responding to this. So that's one of the things we had up. We had other things, information to the public and, you know, it grew, that whole thing grew, but, it, but for the first couple of weeks, we didn't put the full site back up. And then by the time we put it back up, people were, were told, people at the agencies were told to examine their stuff and, and remove stuff that uh, could have compromised us. You know. mm, that's so interesting. Now, you just said everything was lost, all communications. Can you describe for individuals listening what that entails, right? I think people are so wired in today with their phones and their iPads, mm -hmm. but they can't fathom how that happens, right? So, well, well, I mean, it was clearly one of the lessons learned as we'll see later on in the discussion, but a lot of our telecom resources were, were uh, provisioned by, by Verizon, who had their main kind of central uh, location right in that area behind the South Tower. And when they, and I think uh, in the presentation, you'll see some pictures that my team took over there where the building was breached really and all these telecommunication um, 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 controllers and, and uh, other equipment were destroyed. But not only that, the, the sheer weight of the buildings falling down really crushed the underground vaults where all the wiring was. So, all, so it was not just a matter of replacing equipment, it's really replacing all that wiring that, that went into the various hubs that carry the telecom. So, you know, a large part of our work after 9-11 was just finding alternative resources, which in hindsight, obviously, we should have had alternative resources. Like, like we had an alternative resource for the web, web connection, we should have had an alternative resources to everything. Of course, it wouldn't have been everything because it would have been way too expensive. It would have been some set of priority things that everybody wanted. But clearly, you know, the, the, the main job, there was a lot of jobs that we had at the time, and we were a small agency back then. The agency is very large now because uh, once Bloomer came in, we we uh, stood up 311, and 311 like tripled the size of the agency. Uh, but before 311, we were a couple of hundred people in the agency. So it, it was small, and we had a couple of discrete jobs to do. Uh, and so we had to continue doing those and kind of rebuild all that plus deal with all the other uh, requirements having to do with the, uh, well, first of all, with the uh, rescue effort, and then when the rescue turned into recovery and so forth. So th those all these different uh, functions that we took on beyond them, mm -hmm. that. that. But, but again, out of the, uh, out of the nine, um, uh, the Y2K planning, one of the things that we, we created was the ability to very, very quickly deploy local area networks, you know, desktops that were, were quickly being able to connect to an alternate network. So one of the first things we needed to do was to support the emergency operations center. Obviously, uh, it couldn't be at uh, Office of OEM that was eventually destroyed that night, but they evacuated the building very early in the morning. They, were, they no longer occupied the building, but we had to find an alternate location for them so actually the mayor was leading a group of uh, his uh, you know, chief advisors up, uh, up um, I guess it was Church Street towards Canal. And they decided at that time in there, you know, for, based on what they knew, they picked a firehouse that was no longer operational. There was the same firehouse where they shot uh, 
Ghostbusters in. It was an empty firehouse, but it was a nice sized space right uh, off Canal Street uh, over there uh, in, in, in the same, basically on the edge of what the mayor called the crime scene. That's what he wanted to say. So we immediately deployed these local area networks there to get them set up and get started. And by the time we were finished with that, I guess, uh, you know, that day or early the next day, it was very quick. They decided to kind of move further up down and they wound up in the police academy, which is in the Gramercy Park area um, on the east side in the 20s. And then within two days, they decided to move again to the final location, which was uh, the cruise ship terminal. So we basically outfitted three places in a matter of, of days because we had the wherewithal to do that because of the planning that we had and the stuff we had warehoused all over the city. We could quickly dispatch teams to, to get that done. This is fascinating, Avi. And for anyone who's listening to this, um, Avi referenced a presentation. There's an exceedingly thorough PowerPoint presentation that he has that will accompany his file in our archival record if anyone needs that. Um, I wanna just make sure we're driving home the incredible importance of what we're discussing here for the audience, Avi. I mean, if not for you and your team following the mayor around, right? I mean, they were not able to communicate via email, right? If not for you, so- Yeah, we, we, were, we were communicating on the radios initially. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, as part of the uh, request for equipment, we asked to communicate. So actually uh, it was uh, Blackberry and IBM came in with uh, also of asking everybody would, we stood up uh, I think five or six different Blackberry servers around the Civic Center area. And, you know, you knew you were somebody in city government if you got assigned to Blackberry <laughs> in those days. So, so that was the main communication by the second day, third day, that was the main communication. Um, uh, Cause it was clumsy to use those radios. Um, um, and, and, and the people who use the radios every day were more comfortable with them. But for the executives, at least, and for the uh, um, you know, um, you know, people that that was command in command and control, the Blackberries worked uh, wonders. So, mm. Avi, you've referenced Verizon, you've referenced IBM. How well did the city government and these private contractors work together? Because we know there can be a lot of bureaucracy involved in government, right? But yeah. in the aftermath of the tragedy, how did they work together? Well, I mean, we again, as part of the emergency declaration by the mayor, uh, I and several other commissioners were authorized to sign emergency contracts without going through the procurement process that, that's a requirement, that's a normal requirement of city government. So um, that opened up the, the capability to, to move quickly and be very agile. And so as quickly as they could, and it's just not, it wasn't just them, I mean, you know, it was Cisco in large measure, Cisco really helped uh, save the telecommunication part of this. IBM, as I said, was very, very helpful. Uh, um, uh, manufacturers of uh, land equipment, uh, all the standard and all those standard uh, manufacturers were all, everybody came through with stuff. And uh, Cisco actually arranged for an army um, um, giant kind of uh, aircraft and packed it up with stuff on the West Coast and had it flying in the air to, to New York by that night with all sorts of uh, um, telecommunication hub equipment because they knew that that's, that's what had to be replaced. You know, they were partners in creating the network in the first place. So. Mm -hmm. Now, Avi, you said you arrived to the office in Brooklyn around 6 a.m. the morning of the 11th. What time was it before you got to get some sleep that first day? Oh, I don't, I don't think I got sleep for a couple of days. I had a cot in the office and I didn't go home for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I remember I went home for Yom Kippur and I think that was the 26th of September. Wow. So, you know, they're home to Staten Island. I had uh, some of my staff who lived in Staten Island, some uh, kind police officers who were on Staten Island would stop by my, by my house and see my wife and get a clean suit or whatever that I needed. But that's it. Wow. How long would you say it was before you felt you had some sense of normalcy back? 
Oh, well, I, I saw that question, you know, and I really reflected. It was a different normal. It wasn't normal anymore, you know, so it wasn't the same normal. We didn't, we couldn't go back to our regular work. So I would say it would be, it, 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 would, it would have to be when, when, when Mayor Bloomer came in, we kind of refocused. I mean, I spent a lot of time, you know, because, you know, there was an election. Actually, the election had been postponed because of 9 11. The, the first, uh, I think, it was a primary or something, but then the, the, it took place, and then the November election took place, and Bloomberg was elected. Uh, and then once Bloomberg was elected, uh, we were directed to work closely with his transition team. And, you know, we had a, you know, so I, I was actually putting together this whole compendium of of what went on. This PowerPoint is just kind of a overview of all that, but it was a, a three or four loosely binder worth of stuff, including all the contracts, everything we did to track the equipment. I mean, it was really meticulous. Uh, I had my copy of that, my personal copy of that plus the copy. Uh, so unfortunately, the, my personal copy of that was lost in Sandy. We were oh. living right close. We were living right close to the uh, Urban Bay back then, and got, you know, so that, that we lost. Yeah. You know, so. Oh, that was I, I should mention because the time Bloomberg came in, I was allowed to move back uh, into uh, New Jersey. So. Okay. Okay. What were some success stories that you remember, and it could be things big or small that you remember from the period. Well, I mean, you know, we, again, everything that we had planned for, you know, I, I, to me, it would have been horrendous if we couldn't support the mayor in standing up the, uh, you know, the emergency operations center, you know, if, if we if we were, um, you know, not able to, to support the, the, you know, I mean, that, that happened in, in a matter of, matter of days. And again, it didn't happen by ourselves. We had all these private corporations helping us and they were people and equipment and stuff, but it had to be managed, it had to be project managed, it had to be oversight, it had to be audited. I mean, everything had to, to be in place to, it just didn't, ha it didn't happen by, you know, it had to be controlled, you know? So, so that took, so every time you kind of reach one of those milestones where, you know, the first milestone was just that day where we set up the firehouse but clearly that was not gonna be enough. I knew it, everybody knew it, but you know, we had to do what they wanted to do because they had, they had to really manage on the ground. I mean, I would have advised against sending stuff to that firehouse, I think, because it, it was pretty clear after the collapse of, uh, of the second building that that area, you, know, you couldn't work in that area for the, number, you know, for the number of days we'd have to be there and so forth. You'd have to be further away from it for the sheer amount of people that were brought into it, you know, federal, state, city. So, so I, the, the, the brilliant people who came up with, uh, you know, the uh, cruise ship terminal, you know, that was a, a sheer brilliance because it had all the space that was needed. It was serviced uh, on, on the land side by, you know, uh, vehicular uh, transportation, but it was also serviced on the harbor side by ships and, and there was, uh, I remember the president sent over a um, um, a ship. I think it was the Hope, which was a medical ship. But we 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 thought we'd need it, obviously, for victims. But you know, it seemed pretty clear early on there were no victims. You know, a lot of stuff that we even did on on the new website was to support finding the victims, for families to find the victims. But it was it was you know we had to throw all that away because it was clear. But um, uh, we we were able to use that for all the people that were up at the and at the and I have some pictures of the emergency operations center, the final one, in that presentation. But you know those people had to go and sleep and so forth, and they went on the on a on the ship on the Hope ship, where they had accommodations and uh, to be able to get some rest and so forth. I I, I would go up uh, there at least uh, once a day for a meeting with the mayor. There was a, there was a big meeting that the mayor had. And then he had individual meetings for specific issues with each commissioner. And then, um, but I would go back to Metrotech, I, but I had a whole team of people at the, um, at the emergency operation center doing things, particularly the whole mapping function. We, we were very uh, heavily into the whole GIS, geographic information systems technology. And uh, that was, that proved very helpful as 
both part of the rescue and the recovery process to have uh, those um, mapping imaging, both the, uh, the um, you know, um, um, you know, to examine, you know, the integrity of buildings using the maps and uh, 3D images and uh, thermal images of the disaster site. It just helped, it was very helpful for the people who were doing the, the rescue and the recovery. So mm -hmm. that that was a big operation that my my folks did uh, up at uh, at the uh, emergency operation. We ran everything else from Brooklyn: the the restoration of the voice and data services, uh, again by using the prioritization that came out of the Y2K planning, restoration of at least minimal voice and data services to the various agencies that we, we could, and we found. Uh, various ways. We had part of the Y2K planning, uh, this uh, this kind of cooperative was called MARC, Mutual Assistance and Restoration of Communications. And it was all the telecom providers and, and, and myself met two or three times a day by, by teleconference. And um, I would basically challenge them to solve these problems specifically where they were needed. And people would come up with alternative solutions mm -hmm. to those lost uh, communication facilities that I described earlier because of the Verizon. And so these, these telecom vendors, uh, and it was Sprint, uh, you know, people like that, uh, the cable companies, they all had innovative solutions. We use microwave, point to point microwave. We use a lot of, um, I would call elegant, but uh, kind of just in time solutions to get the uh, communications back up so agencies can go back to uh, continue their, their business. You've mentioned the private vendors. Were the military involved in these conversations? Well, the, the military was certainly involved in securing the area. I remember having arguments with these generals and colonels over the phone about giving my staff access so we can do our job. And it was uh, always uh, an interesting, uh, you know, that's what I had, why I had to be there because, you know, somebody needed to kind of support people on the ground. I, 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 uh, I managed to, to, to get down there as much as I could, but I was more useful, you know, being centrally located so everything kind of could flow through me. Um, um, but, you know, I, I really admire those, those uh, guys and girls who went down there. And, and unfortunately, you know, because of the long-term effects of that whole disaster, I, I lost a couple of them you know, uh, and and some of them are still sick. Years later, I mean, I had to obviously document a lot of that stuff, and you know, so so it 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 was people really gave a lot beyond what what we know. You know, who 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 had to continuously go down there. Javi, what were some of the lessons learned that were extrapolated from 9/11 and maybe impacted the way you built back or the way things were done going forward? Yeah, well, you know, obviously the, the uh, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket on the telecom side was was one. I mean, clearly the city had, you know, always and continues to have a special relationship with Verizon. But, you know, we, we realized that, that Verizon itself could not provision us the way they were used to provisioning us by just having one point of failure. And, and then when we were provisioned by Verizon, we ha they had to demonstrate resiliency, but also that we spread it around more and we, 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 we started contracting and uh, out of that came a lot of uh, stuff that my agency did uh, by offering telecommunication franchises to other private companies mm -hmm. that part of getting the franchise uh, was um, so franchise would would allow you to have the right of way in, a, in, a, in through the subway systems and so forth, but the city would have reserved for itself the spare fiber or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so that was part of the plan. So we, we'd have more resiliency. So that was there was an early lesson learned that we were able to uh, ameliorate uh, after uh, you know as as we as we did the recovery, we were able to ameliorate it, and and uh, so that was evolving. And then other things we built, I mean, I, I had submitted, uh, um, you know, applications for FEMA funding to create an emergency uh, 
wireless network. So we wouldn't be dependent on the hard wire. So we had a wireless uh, uh, system that was supported a lot of the, uh, initially was for the emergency fire, but, but then we kind of expanded it for city operations as well. So things like that, you know, clearly were, um, you know, part of the lessons learned. But the other, the other part of it was the human factor. So the human factor really became clear. I mean, because we had displaced agencies, hundreds and hundreds of people worked in that civic center, mm-hmm. thousands, not hundreds, and we had to find different locations for them and, and outfit, outfit, obviously there's locations so they could do their business, the city's business. And one of my uh, gratifying things was, you know, again, it came out of Y2K to create this uh, um, disaster recovery capability for mainframe. So not, so not all the mainframes were consolidated, but we had at least a, a contract with IBM uh, for up at Tuxedo Park to be able to migrate mainframe operations up there. So one agency got specifically uh, affected when the North Tower collapsed, it's the uh, data center was located at 90 Church Street, which is the post office federal building kind of directly across from where the North Tower was on VZ Street. And uh, the south facing windows imploded when the building collapsed and mm-hmm. sucked in all these contam- contaminants. On the 14th floor, they had this data center, a mainframe data center, and it, it was destroyed without being, um, physically, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't tell, but all these contaminants got into the insides of the uh, systems and it was destroyed just like that. So we had to migrate all of that up to Tuxedo, New York. And I worked, that was part of the work that I, you know, so I, I, besides the managing that I had to do, I I had to find something for myself to kind of focus on. And I, it was a good team of people at at housing, at at the housing authority, don't get me wrong. They, they knew what they had to do. are you are you there? Oh yeah. So sorry about that. So uh, there's a good a good team of people there, but I, I was able to kind of mentor them, and because it was my my kind of redundancy plan for the mainframe migration it was for our mainframe, but we were in Brooklyn, we were fine. They needed the help, so we just kind of converted that whole plan to support them. And so when I worked with those great folks at the Housing Authority, um, I became uh, we became enamored of each other. So. After uh, Bloomberg came in, we came to an understanding that I would go and head that uh, technology operation there. And I stayed there for the next uh, 10 years or so. We've talked about some of the successes of the day. Um, Are there things you would have done differently in retrospect? Well, you know, no, because that wouldn't have been the lessons learned. What we had to do was what the plan said. And, you know, that so, uh, you know, I think there was no question that we had the blueprint uh, for, for at least uh, managing um, the, the impact of, uh, of what happened. So uh, I don't know if I would do anything different other than obviously, you know, um, with unlimited uh, resources have uh, multiple, uh, I mean, we had it for the data center. We had multiple power sources. We had multiple uh, points for the web, web connection and all that but it's very expensive to do it for every system. So you, you have to, again, uh, prioritize them and uh, uh, apply uh, the funding mechanisms to support that based on the criticality. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit before I hit record, uh, but what do you want people to remember about 9-11? Why do you want them to remember 9-11, right? I mean, because 9-11 is, is still with us, though some of my students might think it's ancient history, right? You referenced those who are struggling or have lost their lives due to the toxicity they were exposed to at Ground Zero. We are literally right now evacuating Afghanistan, right? I mean, what? why should this still be with us? Well, because we, we can't ever forget. I mean, that's one, one of the reasons I did this PowerPoint. You know, that PowerPoint, uh, I had the uh, honor of making that presentation all over the country for about till at least 2009, I was doing it on a regular basis. And then um, I was doing it locally for a long time, including going back to City University. In, in fact, my wife's company, International Flavors and Fragrances, which was right in uh, Mammoth Beach, which was also obviously hit very badly uh, doing uh, Sandy. 
So before Sandy, I had the opportunity to go and present this to them and talk about, you know, th this kind of planning. And, you know, my wife says that that was helpful in them planning for what ultimately happened in Sandy. So, uh, you know, I think it's important that um, it's an important story to tell and it's an important story to remember. But if the, the presentation is not worth anything, if people don't understand the impact of what happened, which is why I have a lot of those pictures in there. Some of them are kind of horrific, but you have to have the um, visceral kind of connection to the level of, of crisis that it was, the, the horrific uh, the horrific uh, event that it was. Without that, then the, ho the whole thing doesn't have uh, the urgency that it has. So, and I think, you know, now 20 years later, that's why I think, you know, uh, what, what you guys are doing uh, with this here uh, in Monmouth County is so important. It's just another mechanism to ensure that we don't forget. People just look at this, oh, it's another one of those 911 ceremonies. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's just so much more than that because people, you know, if you don't remember this on a visceral level, it's going to happen again, you know. And that's what our government needs to, our government, I think, needs to understand it now based on what's going on in Afghanistan that you know, this is creating kind of a ripe situation for a possibility. Okay, it won't happen again, maybe in exactly the same way. And, and it's different now. Obviously the, uh, the terrorist attacks are so much different now with a cyber warfare, mm. but it's equally, I think, equally um, debilitating uh, if that happens. That's why you have to prevent it. Thank you so well said, Avi. And, you know, we want to create this exhibit which is finite but this repository which will live on and be publicly accessible so we can uh, hopefully continue to remember the lessons of that day so i thank you so much for giving us your time is there anything else you'd like to add no i think that that was one i wanted to add and i i i'm, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to do that excellent well thank you so much and i will keep you posted on the project i'm gonna stop the recording